The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. Well, we're here tonight to hear from Jed York. This is going to be a fun evening. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed seeing all the Super Bowl trophies upstairs. and. <laughs> You wanted to have six up there, didn't you? You wanted to have six. I'm sure Jed would have liked that just as much as you. <laughs> it was close, though. They almost got there. Uh, <laughs> you clearly have a very friendly audience here tonight, Jed, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it, it's just a pleasure to have him here. It, it, we love being able to see all the uh, all the pictures of the new stadium and everything upstairs. Just a little bit of background on Jed, and many of you are from around here. You probably know more about him than I will ever know about him, given that you probably read about him in the paper all the time. But from Ohio, from a family that has a long history, not just with the San Francisco 49ers, but certainly in professional sports more generally. He was a baseball player himself, but obviously now has taken over the football world. Uh, went to Notre Dame as an undergraduate, has an interesting background. He was actually a history and finance major. I did a podcast with him earlier this evening, and I, one of the questions I was asking about, he gave me a history lesson about the kings and rulers of the past and how that related to the, the question that I was talking about. So I was going, I can really tell this guy's a history major, and he listened when he was in history class at Notre Dame. Uh, but he uh, went to his first 49ers game when he was three years old, uh, so he's been a 49ers fan for as long as he can remember. and. Uh, is now the CEO and owner of the company. As you all know, they had a tremendously successful season last year, ending up in the Super Bowl against the Baltimore Ravens. So we are just thrilled to have Jed with us and appreciate you guys uh, hosting us upstairs. And we're looking forward to your remarks. So Jed's going to come up and share some, and then he and I will sit down and have a conversation with you all after his remarks. So welcome, Jed. a vertical challenge, so we'll, we'll try it from, from the floor and see how that goes. So somebody asked me, why, why are you speaking to Pepperdine? Did you go there for school? Do you know somebody there? And my wife just gave birth to our first son, Jackson. He will be six months old in a few weeks. I went to Notre Dame. You know, if he's not going to go to Notre Dame, he might as well go to school in Malibu. So let's, yeah. let's lay the groundwork now and, and just make sure that he has options. It's a pleasure to be here speaking to, to this group tonight. Um, you know, I, I love what I do. And I think it, it shows, I think a lot of people look at the 49ers and they, they look at me and they say, you know, you like going to work every day. And that was one of the questions that was asked of, you know, how do you talk to younger folks? How do you talk to people about being successful in, in their careers? And the thing that I found, and, and I found this when I was an undergrad at Notre Dame. You know, I started off as a finance major. And you know, I'm going to go into business, I'm going to be a finance major. And it just got, to me, monotonous of just doing the same thing. And I love history. History was something that my father always worked with me on, and it was just something that I, I always enjoyed. And I tried to go take a history class as sort of a, you know, one of my electeds elective classes and they said well you know you can't get into that class you have to be a major I'm like okay well like I'll just scan this system and I'll I'll become a history second major and that's how you get into the best history classes and I and once I started I just felt that like this was the right fit for me like I loved being in history class I loved that and I think the combination of history and finance has really served me well and you know you look at how companies are built how empires are built, how organizations are built. And I really look at my grandfather. You know, I don't know that I could have done what my grandfather did. He was born first generation in America. His family came over from Italy. His father passed away on the journey over to America. He was born here. He already had a sister that was two years older than him. So his mother remarries another Italian immigrant in Youngstown, Ohio, who had lost his wife. And it was, you know, at first more out of duty and responsibility to another you know, Italian Catholic and kind of people coming together. And then they had four more kids together. So you have six kids, which you know, wasn't necessarily a, a huge family at, at that time, but it certainly wasn't a small family. So you had a, a group of people that worked together. And you know, education was something that they thought about, 
but they didn't really know how to execute on. And I see that a lot now with you know, immigrants and immigrant families in, in California, where education is something that people want, but they don't always know how to execute on it. So my grandfather, you know, instead of really focusing in on his studies, you know, he liked to gamble. He's six years old, and he'd be the first person out like laying out the craps game. And that's really where you know, he started using his mind and, and, and becoming competitive. You know, where he really started to make money was working with his stepfather in construction. 13, he's driving dump trucks. And he, he loved construction. He loved that piece. And school just bored him to tears. So finally, his mother, like any you know, good Italian Catholic mother, guilted him into, you know, well, you can't do this for the rest of your life. You, you have to go to college. You have to go do something and make more of yourself. So, you know, to make his mother proud, he said, okay. And he said, well, where should I go? You know, what should I do? He's, you know, a C student in high school. He said, well, you know, you're Catholic. Why don't you go to Notre Dame? And he's like, okay, you know, sure. So you pack your stuff up, you take the train, you get to South Bend. And that's not really how Notre Dame works. You don't just knock on the door and say, I'm coming to school. So he worked his way into Notre Dame. You know, he worked construction there. And at the time, Notre Dame was the first school to actually have dormitories as we know them today. Dorms used to be more like an army barracks where you just had you know, everybody in sort of one big room. And Notre Dame gave you your own room if you were a good student. So it was a, you know, a perk to have a single or a double. And my grandfather was actually in the first residence dorm that is like the dorms that we all know today and, and, and sort of come to expect. So my grandfather graduates at the top of his class at Notre Dame in engineering, comes back, graduates in 1932, 1933, he, his stepfather, and his cousins start a construction business where they were building Kelvin model homes. And you know, that's really where they started. And you know, they had a nice little business going. And then World War II breaks out. So being a, a patriotic American, wanting to do something for his country, he, he joins. He's in the Corps of Engineers. And you know, true to his roots, he, he still liked to gamble. So he's gambling with his superior officers one night, wins a ton of money. And instead of paying him, they decide to ship him to a different company. And his original company ended up going to Normandy and going into the bloodiest battle in the history of the world. The company that he got transferred to ended up going to the South Pacific. And he became a decorated officer, helped do the dividing line between North and South Korea. And when he came back, he outranked everybody that he beat in the card game and was able to collect on his money from everybody that was still alive. <laughs> A good memory. <laughs> so, so what happens is he gets back and he sort of sees how, how the world is changing, where you still want sort of that downtown feel of everything is convenient. I can go there and, and shop and do everything. But you didn't want the congestion. You didn't want the pollution that was downtown in the 1940s, 1950s. So what he decided to do was basically bring the downtown to the suburbs. And that's how the shopping mall started. So his first project builds a shopping mall, and he sees that by the time the project's done, there's levels of, of development all the way around his facility. So he looks at that and says, OK, well, the next one of these that I'm going to do, I'm going to buy three times as much land. And as I'm developing the mall, I'm going to start selling off the other parcels to pay down my debt to make sure that I can continue to do this and grow and grow and grow my company. So he ends up building 88 shopping malls. He was a huge sports fan, had several thoroughbred racetracks. He bought the San Francisco 49ers in 1977. He bought the Pittsburgh Penguins a few years later. And you know, he used sort of a combination of luck, skill, drive to build a billion dollar enterprise. And you know, when, when people tell you that you know, I, I, I did it all by myself, like that's it's, it, it, it's not true. You need some help from the outside world, whether it's just hitting the market at the right time, having the right mentor, winning a card game and getting shipped to the South Pacific as opposed to going to Normandy and you know, most likely not making it. So you know, he had that element of luck. He had that element of how do you take this luck and make the most of it? The San Francisco 49ers, he wanted to buy the Cleveland Browns and he wanted to buy the Cleveland Indians. He loved sports. We're from Northeastern Ohio. He wanted to have two teams in the same market, be able to put them together. And at the time, that was sort of when you know, the, the baseball-football stadium combination was in vogue. 
which kind of started here in San Francisco. And that was uh, you know, sort of a, a novel idea. So he looked at that and thought, you know, we can build a new stadium in downtown Cleveland. We can do a nice shopping district there. But the Browns weren't for sale. So he's trying to find some way to get into sports. Loves football. Notre Dame grad. So the Morabito sisters, who were the, the Morabito widows, who were married to the founders, the two brothers, the Morabito brothers, they, one of them married a Notre Dame grad who was also a Catholic, who was also Italian. And he said, you know, this guy, Mr. DeBarlo, seems to be you know, really well respected. And you know, he wants to get into sports. You know, this might make, make a good fit, you know, kind of keeping it in the family, kind of keeping things together. And that's really the introduction to the San Francisco 49ers. Then Al Davis steps in, who if you don't know Al, Al was the, the owner of the Oakland Raiders for a long time. And Al became the broker for the Morbido family. So you have two or three people that are bidding for the 49ers. And my grandfather's at $16 million for the 49ers in 1977. So Al comes up and says, you know, Mr. DeBartolo, if you go to 17, it's yours. And, you know, we can move forward. Now, in today's world, 16 to 17, you go get financing. And, I mean, that's not really a question. In 1977, 16 million to 17 million was a relatively large jump. And he said, you know, Mr. DeBartolo, you're not going to even know the difference. It's going to seem like a rounding error in a short amount of time because football is about to surpass baseball as the number one sport in America. And, you know, once that happens, we're just going to keep growing. So he said, you know, this isn't how I usually do business, but, you know, I, I feel right about this. I feel like we can make something happen. So, so he pulls the trigger. And my uncle, who wasn't really as passionate about the development business as, as my grandfather, was hugely passionate about sports. And for anybody that grew up in the Bay Area or just anybody that's a sports fan in general, you saw that with my uncle. I mean, he just exuded happiness around the San Francisco 49ers. And his passion and drive helped lead the San Francisco 49ers to five Super Bowls. My mother, who I'm not sure how many people follow hockey or like hockey, but as she ran the Pittsburgh Penguins, you know, there's only one trophy in hockey. There's, there's one Stanley Cup. So when you win, you get your name engraved in the cup. My mother's the first woman to have her name engraved in the Stanley Cup. So that's, that's what I grew up with. And when you tie that into history, you watch, you know, folks building an empire, which is very hard to do. But then the next hardest thing to do is passing on an empire and an empire continuing to, to last and to grow and to sustain. And you see that with great companies. You see it with empires all the way back to the beginning of time, that it's just hard to keep that going. And I think I always had a sense of, you know, this is what I want to do, whether it was sports, whether it was, you know, the, the, the shopping mall business, real estate. I wanted to work with my family. And my parents did a really good job of trying to keep me as grounded as possible, but also giving me great opportunities to be successful. And my grandfather, you know, loved playing cards, loved to teach me how to play cards. So we, we'd play gin all the time. And, you know, it's unique when you're flying to games as a six-year-old on a private plane and your grandfather's staking you a hundred bucks to play a game of gin with his buddies. <laughs> but when you're six years old and you're just playing there with your grandfather, who's your idol, and his buddies, you, you feel right at home. And when you start winning games, you know, and your mom takes the money away from you because you're not allowed to have that much money when you're six years old, you know, you, you start feeling a sense of accomplishment and like, you know, I can compete with anybody. So, a few years down the road when you become the president and then the CEO of the San Francisco 49ers and people say, well, you're too young, you know, people aren't going to respect you. It's like, you know, I, I played cards with my grandfather. I, I, I beat him. I beat his friends. Like, I, I can go build a football stadium. Like, this isn't that hard. I can find a way to do it. And I think that helped mold me to, to be in a position where I am now. I was very fortunate to have a unique family where we were always in the spotlight especially in Youngstown, where there aren't a lot of billionaires in Youngstown, Ohio. So when that's what you grow up with, and your grandfather and your father and your mother and your uncle are in the press on a, rarely, on a fairly constant basis, you know, that doesn't really become a daunting idea for you when, when you're put in that situation. And as I tell anybody, if you don't like it, you shouldn't be in professional sports. Like, that's part of your life. That's part of your world. So when I took over the San Francisco 49ers, I had a little bit different entrance into the team than what I had originally anticipated. 
My parents wanted me to go work somewhere else outside of the family, which was a great idea. I went to New York, worked at Guggenheim Partners, who, as you probably know now, bought the Dodgers a few years ago. Worked there for a while in, in, in a different financial settings, first in wealth management, then in a hedge fund risk management, then in our leverage debt group. So 2003, 2004, and we had just hired Dennis Erickson as our head coach. So I was like, okay, you know, we just hired a new coach. Like, you know, I'll, I'll come in, you know, a little later once things kind of get settled and, you know, I'll, I'll continue my path in New York. Well, a 2-14 and 14 season in your second year usually doesn't earn you the right for a third year. And, you know, that's when I talked to my parents. I said, you know, I've been offered a pr promotion at Guggenheim. Not sure that this is really what I want to do. You know, is now the right time to come back? And we talked about it, and it wasn't the right time for me to come in as a vice president. You know, it was the right time for me to come in at the lower levels of the organization, knowing full well when you're the owner's kid, you're not just the lowest man on the totem pole. That might be your job, but that's not how everybody looks at you. So my dad crafted a role for me with the special projects manager that I worked about 50% of the time with our CFO on our stadium project, working for him and assisting him. And then the other 50% of the time, I were rotated around all the different departments within the organization, you know, learning how to sew downstairs in the equipment room, you know, learning how to make ice bags for the players in the training room, learning with our legal department and our sales department and going on calls and doing those types of things, working in our ticketing office and fielding calls from your season ticket holders. And fielding calls from your season ticket holders when you have the first draft pick coming up isn't really a fun position. Yeah. So you, you put all that together, and I think I, I garnered the, the support of, of the troops. And I think my parents saw that, that I probably was ready to take over the team much sooner than anybody expected, probably other than me. And when that happened, you know, my first decision as president of the San Francisco 49ers was to hire Mike Singletary. And he just came off a nice run as our interim head coach. We had a pretty good run the first year at seven and nine, and it looked like we were on the way up. Then the next year, pretty much fell flat on our face. And I tried to explain to folks that I would much rather be two and 14 than eight and eight. And we took a chance with Mike and it didn't work out. But if you're a leader and you make a decision that isn't the right decision, you have to step up and you have to be accountable for it. And I, I knew literally the first game of Mike's second season when we were dominating Seattle. We're up six to nothing at halftime. We end up losing 28 to six. I knew like there's, there's no chance. Like we are not going to get to where I want to go. That was a very, very difficult season for me to go through knowing that as a young guy, I'm out there, I'm taking charge. This is my guy that I hired and it's not the right guy. So you have to figure out how do we put together the right team? So you take a step back. Our general manager had left for personal reasons. We promoted an interim guy to the vice president of player personnel role. So he's in charge of scouting. And now I watched him and I watched the talent that we had on our team. I said, you know, this is, a, this is a pretty good team. We're just not clicking on all cylinders. You know, I watched this for a brief period of time when Mike was the interim coach where we clicked and we played really well. I know we are capable of doing this, you know, and, and Trent has put together some great players. So I kind of went to Trent, you know, in October and said, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the year, but you have the opportunity to be the general manager. I'm not guaranteeing you that position, but you need to assume that you and I are going to go hire the next coach of the 49ers and we're going to build this thing together. So I said, okay, you know, I, I fully understand that. I fully understand you're going to interview other people, but I'm going, to, I'm going to take that opportunity and I'm going to run with it. So he started putting together his list of people. And he had known Jim Harbaugh for probably eight or nine years from just scouting. So when Jim was at USD, he was coaching in one of the college all-star games. And he had by far the lesser talented team when Trent went to scout this all-star game. And he crushed the other team. And he just saw how competitive Jim was. So his, his sort of affection and love affair for Jim started long before Jim turned around the Stanford program. And it's nice when you're the general manager of the 49ers, or at the time the vice president of the player of personnel for the 49ers, and the guy that you like is 15 miles down the road. It's fairly easy to put on your scouting hat and go scout the Sanford players, but actually scout the Stanford coach. So watching how he put together his practice, 
you know, talking to him after practice and just getting a feel for him and understanding, you know, can this guy translate from the college game to the pro game? And that's usually a big question for college coaches stepping up to the next level because it's a lot different when you have guys that are making a lot more money than you versus guys that are dependent on you for a scholarship. So we talked it through and said, okay, you know, this is the guy that we want. And it wasn't because he was doing great at Stanford. It was his competitive nature. It was the fact that he had been a quarterback in the league for 14 years. It was the fact that he took over a team in San Diego and then at Stanford there weren't traditional football powerhouses and literally turned those programs around. And you know, we looked and said, okay, well, what, what are our competitive advantages here? Well, his wife is eight and a half months pregnant. They're living in Palo Alto. You know, probably don't want to move. So how do we go after that? in a different way than everybody else who he was the hottest coaching candidate at the time. How do we go after this differently than everybody else? His alma mater is going after him. You have you know, the Miami Dolphins that are going to go after him and try to make him the highest paid coach in the National Football League. You have John Elway that wants to go after him, who is a Stanford alumni that went down to the Orange Bowl to try to recruit him during the Orange Bowl. So it's like, okay, how do we look at this and, and, and play it to our strengths? So we basically said to him, coach, go in the Orange Bowl. You know, we're going to make a change. If you want to stay at Stanford, stay at Stanford. We're not going to inter interfere with that. We have too good of a relationship with the university. You know, we, we just, we're not going to do that in our own backyard. But if you decide you want to leave, we'd love for you to come here. But we want you to take your time. You know, go interview at Michigan. Go interview wherever you want. We're going to be here. Let's just make sure that we sit down after you win the Orange Bowl and talk about it. So everybody else keeps giving them a deadline. You know, you need, to, you need to tell us this week. You know, you need to tell us tomorrow. Okay, well, you didn't tell us. Well, we'll up the offer a little bit, and then you can tell us, you know, in three days from now. And that was sort of the process that he's going through. I don't know, just out of show of hands, how many people have children? So for the women in the audience, how awesome did you feel at nine months pregnant right before you were ready to have a child, <laughs> like about moving across the country and, you know, your husband not being around? Probably not what you were looking for. So that's why we just took a step back and said, take your time. You're not ready today, take your time. So he calls literally after they win the Orange Bowl. He calls and he's like, you know, Jed, yo, happy to come back and talk. We're going to be back tomorrow. I said, coach, you, you just won the Orange Bowl. It's the first Orange Bowl in the history of Stanford. Why don't you take the time and celebrate with your team and we'll set something up for Wednesday. Just take your time. And, you know, he comes in on Wednesday. We meet at a friend's house kind of far away, far removed from everything. And you know, every time I had seen Jim, it was either on the sidelines of a Stanford game, you know, at, at you know, the big game breakfast where he's in a tie and stuff like that. So he comes in a tie and a suit and everything for the interview. And once you get to know Jim, you know that like, that's like the last time that he's worn a suit and tie. <laughs> and we're sitting there in, in this guy's you know, you know, sort of living room off to the side. And we start around noon. And, you know, we're going and we're talking and, you know, 15, 20 minutes into it, and he looks and he goes, you know, undoes his tie and undoes the button. And he's like, do you, do you mind if I throw in a chew? And I'm like, we got him. Like, it's, it's done. Like, we got him. Like, he's now comfortable. He's now himself. And we didn't know where the lights were in the, in the room. So we ended up talking until, like, 6, 7 o'clock at night until it was too dark. Like, we couldn't see each other. You know, and, and he's still there, you know, getting texts because his wife had just had the baby like the week before. So he's getting texts about, you know, when are you coming home? Like, what's going on? And it's like, coach, like, get out of here. Like, you know, we're good. Like, we can keep talking. And you know, we ended up closing the deal. That was on Wednesday. We ended up closing the deal and having a press conference on Friday. And we, we went on his schedule as opposed to our schedule. And was it, you know, tough to, to not close the deal on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday? Yeah, there was some sleepless nights. But you, you had to make sure that it was the right fit. And I think that's what a lot of people don't understand. You know, it's this guy's great on paper. You know, if we just get this guy, we're, we're going to be set. Whether it's a board going to hire a CEO, a, you know, an institution going to hire a coach. So you need to make sure that it's more than just what's the resume, you know, what's the initial reaction going to be. Because the initial reaction to hiring Trent Baalke as our general manager wasn't really good. You know, you're hiring a guy from within an organization that hasn't won in 10 years, and you're promoting him to general manager, and it's like, oh, it's more of the same. Then you hire Jim, and it's like, okay, 
this is great because you know he just he just went to the Orange Bowl and won the Orange Bowl. And it's like, no, it's not great because of that. It's great because these two people are the two most competitive people that I've ever met in my life. And I'll, I'll give you one Jim Harbaugh story to, to explain this. How many people have caught a foul ball or a home run at a baseball game? How many people have caught more than one? How many have you caught? So five. That's a lot of, that's a lot of balls at a baseball game. A Any guesses on how many Jim Harbaugh's caught? 22. So he's telling me this story, and it's like, it's like you have to be lying. I'm like, that's not possible. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, you have to know like, how to get the ball when you're at the game. You have to, you have to feel it. And you know, I, I met somebody that's here from Chicago. So Jim was drafted by the Bears in the first round in 1987. So he meets a girl and you know, kind of gets set up. And he's like, you know, they set me up with this girl. He's like, she went to some Ivy League school. I don't know what it was. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. What's the difference? And I'm like, OK. You know, she's like, so we go to the Cubs game. Cubs weren't great at that time. We're in the bleachers. And they hit a home run. And I'm sitting there in my jeans and my white t-shirt. I just left practice. You know, and they hit a home run. And I'm, I'm running over to the next section to get it. So I see the ball bounce. It bounces, I dive, I know where it's going, I get it. I, I get the ball, I slide, there's mustard and ketchup on me, and I'm all fired up, everybody's high-fiving me. And he's like, she's disgusted. And he's like, so, you know, I just told her, I'm like, well, you can just go home in a cab. He's like, I'm gonna go out with these people from the game, and we're gonna go drink. Like, that's Jim Harbaugh. Like, he's gonna go get the ball. That's who he is. And, and I think that's something that has driven our team. There was a very talented group of people that you now have a leader that you know will run through the wall. And he will get you to run through the wall. And he gets you to play better than what you can play yourself. And I think that's what we've been able to do. And then you start building a, a sense of, this is a special place. You know, this is a place where guys want to come. This is a place where a guy like Namdi Asimov awesome wants to come and play for, you know, not a ton of guaranteed money because he wants a, a chance to win. This is a place where guys want to sign contracts early and sign extensions and know that they're going to be here for the majority of their career because you're starting to build that chemistry and that character in your locker room. And I think that's what makes me excited. I don't know if we're going to play in the Super Bowl this year, but I know that we are going to be a Super Bowl competitive team for years to come because we've got that core group of talent and we've got people that want to be a part of what we're building. And when you talk about combining success with luck and with guts and drive and trying to build a business, you know, it helps to have a competitive football team when you're building a new football stadium. And you go back to 2006 when we decided to change our focus from San Francisco to Santa Clara. It's like, you know, you're leaving the city. Well, we won an election in 1997 to build a stadium in a shopping mall at Candlestick. Just out of a show of hands, how many people have been to Candlestick? Most of the room has been to Candlestick. How many people enjoy their experience getting in and out of candlestick? <laughs> Not too many people raise their hand. So when you, when you try to build a stadium in a shopping mall on a site that's probably too small for just the stadium itself, you know, the stadium has to be the focal point for Sundays in the fall. It's kind of hard for retail to do well if they're not open on Sundays in the fall, leading up to the Christmas season. So the mall didn't really work out. So then you look at a mixed use project, you know, focusing on res residential. So residential is really hot in 2003, 2004, 2005. But when you're going to build 10,000 units, that's not going to happen in a year. That's going to take a long time to really filter through the market. So as we looked at that and looked at the risk of, you know, are these homes actually going to get built? Are you actually going to have $100 million coming in from this development before any of these homes are up and sold? And oh, by the way, the infrastructure that wasn't really good to begin with we're going to build a 17,000 car parking garage. Now, that might sound like a big number. It might not sound like a big number. The SFO long-term parking garage holds 3,000 cars. 17,000 cars would be the largest event parking garage in the world. That's not really the type of environment and atmosphere you want for your fans that want to tailgate, that want to have a great fan experience. So when you look at all that, it didn't make a lot of sense to build a football stadium right there at Candlestick the way they were talking. So they said, well, maybe we can build it at Hunter's Point. Hunter's Point infrastructure is worse than what it is at Candlestick. It's that much farther away from, from, from the freeway. And oh, by the way, it's a toxic Superfund site. Probably not the best place to build a football stadium. 
But we said, okay, we'll look at it. But in the meantime, we're going to look at Santa Clara, where the infrastructure has been in place for the last 15 years. You know, our fan base, two thirds is between San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda County. And oh, by the way, Santa Clara just happens to be right in the middle of that. We've had our training facility here since 1988, and we're still going to be the San Francisco 49ers. So when you start, you've got a mayor of San Francisco that doesn't like that idea. You've got a senator that represents the entire state of California in Washington, D.C., that was as vocal of an opponent as you can get that said, you know, you can't be the San Francisco 49ers if you're building Santa Clara. You have to be the Santa Clara microchips. <laughs> so when you're, when you're in your, your mid to late 20s and you're battling, you know, public and fan perception, you're battling a mayor that certainly had much higher political aspirations than being mayor of San Francisco and a long-term established senator, you know, that's a pretty daunting opponent. And what we said was, okay, we're going to take some punches. We're going to take some punches to the face. And you, you need to learn how to do that if you're going to be a public figure, if you're going to run a, a, a major corporation that's in the, in the spotlight every day. So let's take those punches and let's just start from the grassroots in Santa Clara. My dad and I went door to door. I probably did, you know, hundreds of coffee talks that were people that were much smaller than this group here, meeting with five, ten people for two, three hours in their living rooms, you know, and sometimes on Friday nights. And that was one of the things that one of, one of the women asked me. I was in her house and she said, you know, how, how dedicated are you to actually getting this done? I said, ma'am, I said, you know, I don't mean to be flippant, but I, I just want to point out that I'm, I'm 28 years old. It's Friday night and I'm in your living room <laughs> talking to you about this project. How dedicated do you think I am to this? And she said, fair enough, I, I get it. So when you have that dynamic, you start building ground support. You get to a place in 2010 where you win an election by a 60 to 40 margin. And you keep talking about, we're going to build a functionally green stadium. We're going to build a tech-friendly stadium. And we're going to make sure that user experience is first and foremost. And when you start with user experience, you start with bringing your fans lower and closer to the field. So a candlestick, about 50% of our fans are in their lower bowl, 50% of the fans are in the upper deck. And not to mention that it's you know, a stadium that was built for baseball in the 1960s with 19 feet concourses. So we said, OK, let's make them 70 feet concourses. Let's double the amount of women's restrooms in the building. And let's make sure that 2 thirds of our fans are in the lower bowl. And let's make sure that when we do the upper deck, that we do it on one side of the field between the end zones. And then we put the majority of the suites in a tower on one side of the building. So what happens is you bring that upper deck lower and closer to the field. So it feels more like the mezzanine level. So you don't feel like you're out there away from everything. You're really, really close to your lower bowl patrons. So everybody's kind of there together. The majority of your suites are built on one side of the stadium. So when you're looking at a functionally green stadium, the majority of your energy usage is, is now in a third of your building as opposed to being spread all the way around your building. And when you're looking at servicing your premium patrons, it's a lot easier to have one gigantic kitchen on one side of the stadium that can service people by going up as opposed to a kitchen on one side or the other and trying to get something up and around to a suite holder. So we wanted to make sure that our fans came first. When you look at technology, you know, it's easy to say we're going to build a $50 million scoreboard. You know, that sounds great. You know, you're going to build the biggest scoreboard that anybody's ever seen, but that's a hardware solution. We're in Silicon Valley. Hardware isn't really what lasts in Silicon Valley. So how many people have smartphones? Majority of people have smartphones. How many iPhones? Mostly iPhones. How many Androids? Couple Androids, couple other phones. So instead of us trying to pick one versus the other, we want you to choose what's your hardware. And how many people have bought a phone in the last 18 months? Most people bought a new phone in the last 18 months. So if you're going to spend anywhere from $500 to $1,000 every 18 months, we've got 68,000 fans, 68,000 season ticket holders, you're going to spend that $50 million in what Jerry Jones spent on a scoreboard every two years on your own hardware. So we have focused on building all the infrastructure, the entire technology stack to make sure whatever you're using is fully functional inside the stadium. There are apps that are only used inside the stadium to get inside the game so you can watch different camera angles. You can have a ticketless stadium, a cashless stadium. 
you can have different views of the field, different announcers that are on the field that are giving you insights into the game that you don't get anywhere else but inside the stadium, that you have a live feed to our broadcast, which is a great thing when you're a fan. You want to listen to the broadcast. You want to know what's going on. You're trying to text people back home when there's a big instant replay and what, what's happening, like what are you seeing, what are they saying. You're going to know that. And you're going to have the ability to check anything that you want inside or out of the stadium because we want to make sure that you have a great experience at home inside the stadium. And that's what we've tried to build out. When you look at the sustainability, you want to be functionally green. You don't want to just be green for green's sake. We'll be the first lead NFL stadium, but we'll also be net neutral to the grid for our 10 home games, which means our 10 home games will be completely powered by the sun. So we'll generate enough power throughout the year that we will be the only stadium in Northern California that can say that. But how do you do that functionally? Well, when you build the majority of your suites on one side of the building and you build a nice green roof, you can now put 1,000 people on top of that roof. So you know, from our fan from, the, from Chicago, I'm sure you've been to Wrigley. I'm sure you've you know, been to games across the street when they have big parties and things like that on the apartment buildings. Imagine that type of atmosphere, but it's actually connected to the game and it's part of the game, where you have a great view of the stadium, you have a great view of everything that's going on, but on a clear day, you're going to be able to see all the way down to downtown San Francisco. You're going to see downtown San Jose. You're going to see the mountain ranges on both sides of the bay. It's going to be just an unbelievable place to watch a game. And I think that speaks to Northern California. The other thing that speaks to Northern California is food and wine. You know, this is a great culinary region. So how do you make sure that you have a great organic, natural hot dog that's local to San Francisco? You know, you find a chef like a Thomas Keller that says, you know, I can build a great hot dog. I can make sure that we can do something. Now, he's not going to serve it to, you know, 68,000 people. And you have a bunch of different chefs trying to come up with a perfect hot dog for us that instead of grilling it where we kind of trick you into buying a hot dog and make you think that it's a good hot dog because it smells good, you know, we want it to actually be great product inside and steam it in Anchor Steam beer to make sure that it's easy for you to get your hot dog anywhere in the stadium quickly, but it's going to be a great product. And you want to go down to that level of detail to make sure that the fan experience is everything that it's supposed to be in a stadium. That you want to make sure that your kids, you feel comfortable when your kids or your grandkids are going to order a hot dog, that it's not going to be bad food. It's going to be something you feel comfortable with them eating. And I think that's the environment, that's the type of atmosphere that we try to build with the stadium. And when you combine the success on the field, you know, the great things that we're doing off the field, and the fact that I don't think there's a better economy anywhere in the world than Silicon Valley right now. When you look at the companies that have gone public, you look at the cost of capital. You know, when you tie all those things together, you get a pretty successful project. And you know, a lot of that is leadership and the great team that we've built. And a lot of it is just pure luck of timing. And you, that's where great leaders really excel. You, you make the most of your opportunities. And we have a great opportunity right now. And I think we're going to have the greatest outdoor fan experience of any stadium in the world, of any outdoor entertainment venue in the world. And I think we're going to have a team that competes for Super Bowls year in and year out and wins with class. And that's what we've tried to build. And you know, I'm happy to turn it over. I think we're going to have a conversation now. And then I'm happy to turn it over to any questions from the audience after that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You can take this.